Welcome to another Last Hour Bereans, Last Days Update, where we discuss Bible prophecy, expose the wolves and false teachings that have crept into the church, declaring the soon return of the Lord, first for his church in the air, and then with his church at the end of the tribulation. Look up for our redemption draws nigh. Welcome everyone to another LHB Last Days Update, and uh, today we're going to be going through uh, uh, chapter 19 of the book of Revelation, part 19 on our series called The Journey Through the Apocalypse. Back with us, we, of course, we have Brother Lewis. Brother Lewis, why don't you say hello to the viewers? Welcome everyone back uh, in uh, chapter 19, and all you can say about this chapter is uh, the king is coming. Amen, man. I, and I'll tell you what, I can't wait, brother. This world yeah. is going to be, uh, as as the cool kids say, shook to the core. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. All right, so you have your Bible uh, handy there. And as always, yeah. we're going to go ahead and read through the chapter, then we'll backtrack and start breaking down some verses. So whenever you're ready, Lewis, go for it. All right. And it says, <clears throat> And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgment, for he has judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And, <clears throat> and the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God, that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And the voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all, you, all ye his servants, and ye that fe fear him, both small and great. And I heard of it was the voice of a great multitude, and the voice of many water, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true saints of God. And I fell at his feet and to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren, and I have testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven open, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as flame of fire, and on his heads were many crowns, and he had a name written, that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of the kings and the flesh of the captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their army gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought, wrought miracles before him, which he deceived them that he had received the, mass, the mark of the beast. And to them that worship his image, these both were cast into the lake of the burning and the, the lake of the fire burning with brimstones. And the remnants were slain with the sword, sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeds out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Amen, brother. 
let me tell you, brother, this 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 is a chapter that is loaded. Okay. So number one, overall, this is talking about the return yeah. of the king, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. It says here in verse two, for true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore. Now yeah. we, we have already discussed in the last few chapters that the great whore is none other than um, Rome, the revived Roman Empire, oh, which yeah. you know incorporates um, uh, a political and religious entity, uh, most of which is in the Catholic uh, Church. Now it says here that this great whore did corrupt the earth with with her fornication. Now we're talking about spiritual fornication, spiritual. Yeah. yeah, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Now. We, we're talking about the bloodshed, you know, since this entity came into power, you know, from the Roman Colosseum to the Inquisitions to the Crusades, all the way down, and you know, um, and throughout history. And God is going to finally uh, judge her in full measure, right? Yes. Um, and and you know, it's just fornication. It's a spiritual fornication, and we know that it's going to be a one-world religion. Um, and we know uh, from what we read last chapter, it is the Catholic Church. It, it's very specific in how it, uh, the, that person, that, uh, Babylon, that represents Babylon, it is dressed. Very specific. And, and, and when you think about it, who today dresses that way? And, and it's the Pope. I mean, it's, it's you, you, you see the, uh, the, the fact that he wants you to know that it's the Pope. Um, not, not, only, uh, not only the Pope, uh, the, the Pope, the Cardinals, the bishops, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, the, whole, the pre yeah. regular priests, uh, I mean, they're all dressed the same. Yeah, um, you know, from the very top, and and has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Um, you, you know, throughout history, the uh, the Catholic Church has been one bloody church, uh, killing people left and right, torturing people. Um and and yes, they did a few years back. John Paul II, I think you know he apologized for a lot of things, um, but it's uh, too little, too late for them. Yeah, and I don't think he apologized for everything. And you know why? It, it, here's the thing: I want people, especially Catholics, to think about: Why does the Pope have to apologize at all if he's God on the earth? I thought God was perfect. Yeah, Jesus just doesn't saying? need to apologize. Exactly. You know, yeah, if, if you're God on the earth, number one, there's a few problems here. Um, you you know, is you're laden with sin. You know, uh, you're still getting older, which means you're still under the curse of death. Um, and you, you, some of these popes, like the current one, wearing glasses, uh, that means you're you're not God because God doesn't need glasses. Matter of yeah. fact, there's two popes existing at the same time right now: yeah. Pope Benedict and Francis. Yeah. Right? It so never we have happened. Problems. Yeah, we have a problem. There's there's two uh, embodiments of God down here apparently in the Catholic Church. There there's so many contradictions with that 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 church, and I use that term church loosely because that's not the Church of God for sure. Um, that is mystery Babylon. Now, what's interesting is in verse three, it says, and again they said, Hallelujah, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. Now, what strikes me in this is the forever and ever part. So this is talking about more than just an earthly destruction, isn't it? Yes, and, and we were talking before about uh, Jehovah's Witness not believing in, in hell, and, and they talk only about the smoke, but you can't have smoke forever and ever unless it's a fire. Okay, right. and, and this is what it, yeah, and it, it, it talks about, you know, uh, it rose up forever and ever, it means there's no, for an eternity, the punishment is eternal. Uh, the sin against an eternal God is eternal, so the punishment is eternal. That's right. There's no, you know, when people teach an, uh, annihilationism, you know, you're just going to get annihilated uh, once you're once you go to hell. You're just going to be obliterated, so to speak. No more trace of your existence. Well, how can you be punished if you don't exist? You yes. see, you, that, that's like an escape. 
And God is not about to let you off the hook because you just want to be annihilated. That means you get to live a life of sin and re rebellion on planet Earth and just get annihilated uh, after after you die. That doesn't make sense. And uh, the wording of the book of Revelation, like, like we just talked about, forever and ever, eternal torment and things like that, yeah. that tells me that, like you said, since the sins are against an eternal God, that he will require an eternal punishment because the person who is sinned against is the one usually offended and God yeah. is offended. And since he has no end, that offense will go on forever, which means as long as he exists, that punishment will exist because he's going to forever be offended at those sins. Correct. Correct. And, and, and the word tells us what he does to the sins of the saints that uh, he throws them in the deep uh, ocean and he forgets about them. But those who do not put their trust in him, their sins are always going to be there. He oh, will remember man. them. And we read I, that last chapter where he remembered their sins. Yeah, you know, I, that's terrifying to think about. You know, we, you know, you and I often talk off camera about these kind of things, heaven, hell, and why, you know, most churches today don't even preach on hell. Uh, they they just teach you uh, your best life now, you know, uh, give uh, uh, to God so you could get financial blessings and, you know, all of this nonsense. And they fail to warn people about the dangers of dying without the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Um, co correct. Um, and, and this is what Satan wants. He doesn't want people to know about this. Um, he doesn't want people to be frightened uh, into uh, starting to think about where am I going to go in, uh, for, you know, in, in eternity? Um, and do I need someone that will forgive my sins so uh, I can be cleansed of them? And so this is not something that Satan wants people to know. Right, right. And uh, unfortunately, uh, he's doing a pretty uh, good job at deceiving a lot of people into thinking some Christians now, and I, I, I use that term loosely, uh, even uh, believe there is no hell. I mean, they believe that, you know, a loving God will never create such a place, even though Jesus Christ himself talked twice on hell than he did on heaven, because he wants to warn us of the wrath to come. He doesn't want us to go there. And you warn people that you love of the impending doom, the danger of uh, living a life apart from him, right? Um, correct. You, when you, it's like with your children. You constantly warn them of what could go wrong and, and all the dangers that are out there uh, if they make certain decisions. Um, you know, you tell them that there's good out there, but but you concentrate on the bad because you want them to understand that, um, that, that there is there is a danger out there. Um, and in this case, it's a danger that you're going to spend eternity in hell. Yeah, and you're talking about children. Uh, that's what that's what we do with children. Now, these yeah. in the world are not God's children at all. And that's even worse for them yeah. because they're actually the enemies of God. Uh, yes, and, you know, uh, the word says that, you know, um, your friendliness with the world is uh, enmity uh, with God. So enmity with God. Uh, Amen. Yeah. Yeah. You're 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 an enemy of God. You, you yeah. only become his friend when, you know, you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Oh, yeah. You become his friend. You become his family. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's just, you know, I just wish and I pray that more uh, churches, you know, and pastors, because these pastors are going to be held uh, to a high responsibility before the Lord because they are failing miserably to preach on hell. Um, they're failing miserably to preach on uh, on the wages of sin, which leads to early death. And, um, you know, uh, that's a whole nother uh, uh, story for another Rapid. time. But, you know, <laughs> that's going to lead us down a rabbit trail. We, we don't want to follow right now because it's going to take us away from the main topic. Well, verse seven, it says this. Let us be glad and rejoice. Talking about the saints in heaven again and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. The marriage of the Lamb, which takes place in heaven, yes. and his wife, who is his wife? You know, I, I used to uh, go to this house, and, you know, every, every you know, Maria and I used to give uh, uh, a small class on, on, on the word to people that were new. Um, and one of the guys there, um, it was like, I'm nobody's wife. You know, it's like, you know, I'm a man. I'm nobody's wife. Did not understand what it, it means to be the wife. It's a spiritual 
union. It's a symbolism, it's a, right? <laughs> symbolism that you are going to be together. And 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 he was saying that it is like a marriage between the man and the wife. It is forever, and it is supposed to be two people. Okay, and and, and the two become one. And, That's and right. And this is the relationship with Jesus. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. Yeah, people think, oh, am I going to turn into a woman? No, no, it's it's a symbolism, man. It, yeah. Like you said, it's talking about our, our description, our relationship once we get saved, you know, our relationship. And, and you know, and we're the wife because we are the weaker vessel. Christ yeah. is obviously much stronger than we are, infinitely stronger. So he would be in the husband role, right? And we would be in the wife role. And But the thing is, the two have become one. The husband is not greater than the wife, and the wife is not greater than the husband, even though Christ is much greater than us all. But it's telling you that you're going to be a, in a partnered relationship forever, an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ that can never be broken. Right, brother? Uh, correct. This is, uh, this is eternal. I mean, in his presence, with him, sharing everything that he has made from the beginning, uh, uh, before the foundation of the earth, for us to enjoy uh, that relationship with him. You know, brother, uh, the, this is speaking of the marriage of the Lamb, you know, I, I, I envision this this wonderful ceremony uh, in heaven, you know, uh, right before the return as we're getting officially united to the Lord. And it's not like a marriage on earth or anything like that. You know, right. You know, this is just another symbolism. And it's going to be a ceremony of some kind. We don't know yet. We don't know it because the Bible doesn't go into details on that. But it's going to be fantastic, isn't it? Uh, yes. I, I, you know, uh, later chapters, it, it talks a little bit of the, the you know. Uh, the supper and, 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 you know, but it is a, it's a union. It is the promise that God made first to the Jews and then to us uh, after we became Christians. Uh, it's a promise that God has made and, and he will uh, make sure that all his promises, um, he, he will complete them. And, you know, uh, it, it, like on an earthly marriage, you know, we, you know, a person goes to the church, they get married and they usually have uh, the reception the 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 supper in another location so you'll go to one place to get married and then travel to another location to, to celebrate and have a supper and it's the same thing here the marriage takes place in heaven but the supper is going to take place in the millennium isn't it uh yes um after the millennium well at the millennium and, and it tells you later on um that when jesus come it, it tells you who's coming with him uh yes. and he's talking about us Amen, the bride. Amen, brother. Okay. In verse 8, it says this. And to her, the bride, was granted that she should be arrayed or clothed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Now, this, okay, is amazing because I believe the fine linen that it's talking about here is our glorification, yeah, our glorified body. state. Yes. Yeah, it's not literal, you know, uh, like linen you find down here. This is something that's that's going to be fit for mm -hmm. a bride of Christ. This is going to be something that's filled with glory. And I, I look at this and I'm like, wow. And it's talking about this being the righteousness of the saints, right, brother? Correct. And being in South Florida. Uh, being Cuban, um, there's a large uh, percentage of Cubans um, that are into what you know, called Santeria, voodoo, black magic, whatever you want to call it, it's still the same. And the fact that they dress in white when, when they make this pact, and they make this pact with the devil, and they dress in white, and they call themselves santos, saints, okay? Wow. This is something that Satan has turned around um, and, and, and done this, and these people actually and this was taken from this verse right here, where it says the saints are dressed in fine linen. Oh, wow. Um, so they take this and yeah. they, they use it in their occult practices. Yeah, yes. And, and, and they dress in fine linen on earth because they will not dress in fine linen in heaven. Amen. Uh, it's a, you know, it's amazing that you mentioned Santeria. And yes, down here in, in South Florida, we, you know, we have Santeria, we have voodoo, and it's just it's very bad in, in those things. But um, uh, the fact that they use the the white yes it's it's self-righteousness 
Yes. And, and, and not only is it self-righteousness, the Santeria, it's compatible with the Catholic Church. They have, usually they have Catholic uh, uh, statues of, of the Virgin Mary and Jesus and the saints, just like a Catholic Church, and the two are compatible. Now, if the Catholic Church, again, was the true Church of Christ, there would be no way that would be compatible, right? Correct. Um, and, and like you said, they dress in white because they are saints according to what they have done. Okay, not what they uh, Jesus has done for them. So it's pride again. Is I am a saint because this is what 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 I did, and and that's who I am now. So it's pride, um, mostly what leads them to this. Um, they actually do go to Cuba, and they pay a lot of money to what is called, in other terms, a godfather that will indoctrinate them and will give them, and they have ranks. Um, uh, but it's all to copy Jesus and, and, and the saints. It, it's, it, it's clearly visible um, what they're doing uh, yeah. by, by doing this. Yeah, they do all those rituals as if, you know, uh, that's going to somehow cover their sins. It, it's, it's really sad. Matter of fact, I don't even think they admit they're sinners. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, you and I knew a, uh, a person that practiced Santa Dia when we worked at Lowe's. And I can tell you what, man, pride is, pride is a major yeah. uh, factor in, yeah. in that. Yes, all right. Is. So <clears throat> verse 9 says, and he saith unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. All of those who are called to the marriage supper are blessed. Yeah. You know, um, we see a lot of ugly things down here in this present world that we're living in. And Christians seem to get the short end of the stick. We we seem to to uh, be aggravated by the ungodly, to, to be frustrated by the ungodly, uh, like the thorn in the flesh by the ungodly, mm -hmm. falsely accused by the ungodly. But here it says that we're blessed. Why are we blessed, my brother? And, and it tells you at the end, these are the true sayings of God. We are blessed because God has promised us that if we turn to him, we accept him as our Lord and Savior, okay, we are going to be blessed by becoming his children, by spending eternity with him. Uh, and it mentions against the marriage supper of the Lamb, that we are going to be one, uh, like in the, in the marriage between a man and a woman. We are blessed because we will be one for all eternity. And, you know, what, what people don't seem to re realize is this world is temporary. The saints are going to inherit an eternal creation, meaning not just planet Earth. We're going to we're going to in inherit the entire heavens, the new heavens, the new Earth, none yeah. of which that will be destroyed ever again. So All think right. about this. We have temporary sufferings in this present time, but this present world is is on its way out. It's designated for destruction by fire from heaven. And where it says the heavens will melt with fervent heat. So we are blessed because we are the inheritors of a new creation. Right, brother? Uh, correct. And, and all of this was done uh, from before the foundation of the world for us. Now, um, most people say, well, why is this such a huge universe? Why do you have so many uh, uh, suns and planets and and why is it? I mean, there's got to be life out there. Now, this was this is this is prepared for us, for for the saints to enjoy when we are in uh, in, in eternity with with Jesus. There's Amen. a plan that God has that we don't understand all of it. We actually understand very little of it, but it's there for us. He did all of this for us. And maybe one of these days we'll do a. Uh... Uh, a little topic or teaching on aliens and UFOs and things of that nature yeah. and what they really yeah. are, because the Bible does give us an answer for those so-called sightings that people are seeing. And we're talking about, we're not talking about the hoaxes. We're talking about the ones that are verified that yeah. these are, these are, they're, they're unexplained, but the Bible explains them and who they are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, God is so good to us that he gave us who, the identity of these so-called unidentified uh, uh, entities. Okay. In verse 10, 
<laughs> you got to love John here because you, yeah. it shows his humanity. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It says, and I fell at his feet, talking about the angel that's talking to him. So John falls at his feet to worship him. <laughs> and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I love this verse because those who teach Bible prophecy, we're actually fulfilling the will of Jesus Christ. It's the spirit of prophecy. And number two, uh, John, <laughs> he does this twice, by the way, he falls down. It, because he's in awe of this this magnificent angel that's before him and to worship him. And you could tell this is an angel of the Lord because he says, no, 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 John, get up. <laughs> get up. We only worship God here. Get up, bro. Get up. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? But, but, uh, but you know, uh, we, we don't know. Okay. My case, we don't know what an angel looks like. Um, Bible talks about appearances and, 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 um, you, you know, when uh, John's father was in the temple and the angel came to him, you know, it's just, he, he, he was the in awe. John the Baptist. Yeah, yeah, the Baptist father, yeah. Um, and so when we see an angel, for those, okay, uh, that uh, have seen angels in, in the Word of God, uh, the, the ones in the Bible, okay, th these are just powerful. Be you know when you stand in front of power, in authority, and this is what they are. So John, in his knowing that he's just human, he's standing in his presence. So you know, automatically, the human side, like you said, uh, <laughs> we, we 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 tend to to bow, you know. Yeah, and you know, uh, speaking of angels, man, the, uh, listen, their true appearances, uh, it must be terrifying, yeah. because every time, uh, and we're talking about an angel of God here. Every time an angel of God appeared, the first thing, one of the first things they have to say is. Fear not. <laughs> yes, yes. They always have to say, "Hey, hey, don't be afraid. I'm a, I'm one of the good guys. I'm on your side. Yeah. You know, I'm from the Lord. Don't worry. I'm here to you know help you, protect you. Yeah. You know, uh, and 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 so their true nature is very intimidating, very terrifying. And yeah. but what's what's uh, just ha almost hard to believe is that the saints in the future will have more glory than them. Yes. And this is what. It blows my mind because we know we are unworthy creatures. We are, you know, sinners saved by grace. We are not worthy of anything good God has for us, right? Correct. Uh, in a glorified body, um, you, you know, as much as John uh, is, is bowing down to an angel because of what he sees in his glorified body, uh, he will be above the angels. Uh, he will be given authority over the angels. Um, and, and, and it's hard for us to imagine this. Uh, we 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 don't we just don't understand um, what 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 we're going to have when we get to heaven. Amen, brother. Amen. So verse ten says, "And I fell at his feet." We already read that. I fell at his feet yeah. to worship him. Okay, verse eleven. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness. Righteousness, he doth judge and make war. All right. So heaven is opened, and mm. behold, he sees a white horse, and the person that sits on this white horse, and we know that this is Jesus Christ himself. This is the thing. A lot of people believe this is a literal white horse. I don't believe this is a literal white horse. I think it's a symbol of his royalty. It's a symbol of his warfare that he's coming to make. Um, the reason being, because if the white horse is literal, then in verse 19, where it says, or, ver, or, or yeah, verse 19, it says, his eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. So then he would have to have many crowns sticking mm -hmm. up all the way in, in, into the heavens. You know, yeah. this is a literal, a literal uh, uh, thing, okay? And in verse 15, it says, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. So again, if this yeah. white horse is literal, then all of the other imagery uh, uh, that's surrounding this passage must be literal too. So he has to have a large sword coming out of his mouth, crowns all the way up to the heavens, and he has to be swinging his head, I guess, to slay the enemies. That, yeah. <laughs> that's not what that's talking about, is it, brother? Uh, no, no. Um, you know, in the Old Testament, um, kings were uh, crowned on, on, on a donkey. Um, because it represented, um, you know, the burden humility. of the people, humility, 
um, and and Jesus came into in, into Jerusalem on the donkey uh, because it's it's an it's an animal it's, it's a noble animal okay but now we are talking about someone who's coming to make war and that's what a horse is a horse is an animal and it means war it's an instrument of war so yeah, it's, it's a war symbolism charge. yes it's a symbolism of of he's telling you he's not coming in peace he's coming to make war and then. Everything that you talked about would be explained a little bit on in this chapter of what everything means, but it's all symbolism. It's all symbolism. And again, you know, uh, you know, if why would Christ need a horse to travel on? Think about it. In that book of Acts, at the ascension, the two angels appeared before you know yeah. in front of the disciples and saying, Hey, why are you guys, you know, weeping? Why are you guys worried? This same Jesus that has been taken up from you will come the same way he's gone up. Now, unless Jesus went up on a horse that we didn't see, he went up bodily without a horse. So as again, the horse, the sword, the many crowns on his head are all symbolisms yeah. that, that show what he's gonna come to do, what he represents, his his kingship, his his glory, all of that. That's all it and the fires in his eyes, meaning he's coming uh, to judge. Okay. Anger. Anger, right? Fury, like you, you know, we mentioned fury. And hit the sword out of his mouth, you know, the word of God. In Hebrews it says the word is quick and sharp like a two-edged sword. It's it's not a literal physical sword. This right. is a sword uh, of the spirit of the word. This is his word that will annihilate. The armies of Antichrist, and as you're going to see, and as you're going to probably uh, talk about this uh, in a short time, the blood of that battle is going to be horrendous, right, brother? Uh, correct. Um, and, and this is where knowing uh, the Word of God comes in. Uh, when, when you talk about, the, you know, He's coming back as He ascended, and He's going to come the same way, and, and and that's when you have to realize that, okay. For me to know how he's coming back, I, I need to know how he left, how, how the word says he left. Um, the, and, and like you said, the word is a two-edged sword, and it, it, it digs deep like into your bones. Um, in the time of the uh, King David and, and Solomon, swords were really more hacking things than, you know, in, in wars. By the time Jesus came around, the two-edged sword, the ones that you stab with, um, was in place. So, He's talking about things that people understood at the time that he was writing this. And, and you know, and people uh, understood to, to, mention, to mention that two-edged sword, too, it had another advantage. Uh, you could cut either way. You didn't yeah. have to turn the hilt, you know, yeah. you know, to the sharp side. Both sides was the sharp side. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's a more, more destructive weapon than when they used to do, uh, use in, in King David. So it's telling you that he's coming with something. That is, um, you don't want to be at the end of it. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, speaking of that blood, um, it says here, let's see if I can find the, uh, the verse here. Okay, 13. 13, is it? Uh, yeah, yeah, 13, 13, 13. Okay. So 13 says, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now, again, this is all part of that symbolism. He's not literally coming with blood on his garments yeah. because it's just re it's representing the bloodshed that he will cause. And you know, when, when people talk, hear this, they say, "Oh, that sounds like a hateful God." Listen, God is not hateful; He's love, but He is holy. He is righteous. Okay, he 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 cannot stand sin, and he will judge sin wherever it is found. Right, brother? Uh, correct. And and it's a misunderstanding that people have, and they look at you know it's like a hateful um, God. Um, but the fact that you said he's righteous and he's just, so he has to act upon what his character is, and this is part of uh, the punishment for those who oppose him, who didn't believe in him who walked away from him, and, and he has to meet out this punishment because he is righteous, he is holy, he is just. Amen, brother, amen. And it says his vesture was dipped in blood. Now, we talked about the, the, the blood going up to the bridle of a horse a few chapters back, yeah. a few weeks back, and um, it, that's and, it, and it's going to cover the entire 
desert in the Middle East there. That's how that's how much blood is going to be spilled by by the word of God, isn't it? Yeah, and, and if you stand next to a horse, uh, you, you're talking about three to four feet. Uh, the, the bridle, uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, that's how high it is in some horses. Um, that, that's a lot of blood. And, uh, and, because, <laughs> yes, yes. And, and we were talking about the 200 million men army, and that's the blood of 200 million. I mean, that's, that's a lot of blood. That's a lot of blood because you're talking about the entire Antichrist army or the majority of them, yeah. because obviously some will survive that maybe didn't take the mark and they will be at the sheep and goat judgments. Um, mm -hmm. But but yeah, that, that blood, you know, when 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 people think that evil is getting is is victorious, that people are getting away with evil acts and, and sin and debauchery and all of this, they think, oh, life is good. They have no clue what's coming. You know, uh, Christians, we like, you know, we try to warn people every week on this program. We try to warn people. We try to point people to the Savior because we know that it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a vengeful God, correct? Correct. Uh, but this is uh, Satan's lie. You know, th this is what he ma makes them believe that, you know, you, you, you get away with it uh, and then you die and that's it. You know, nothing happens. So you, you have enjoyed your evil ways, and there's no punishment for it. And this is what right. Satan wants everyone to believe. That's why the word was written, for people to know and understand what's coming for those uh, who do evil on the earth. You know, brother, uh, verse 19, uh, you know, this verse 19 proves that the rapture has to be a pre-trib event, because in Matthew 24, and you and I believe the rapture can be found in Matthew 24. A lot yeah. of uh, brethren, they don't believe that, but we have evidence for there to be a, a, a rapture mentioned in Matthew 24. And it says that uh, no one knows the day or hour in Matthew 24, mm -hmm. right? No one knows the day or oh, hour. Right. So verse 19 in chapter 19 of Revelation says something very interesting. It says, and I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Now, listen, in order to gather the entire army against someone that's coming, you have to know they're coming. Yes. Satan knew that he had seven years. So yeah. this cannot be the rapture. This has to be something that he even he knows to prepare for, right? But Correct. the rapture is a seamless event. It comes upon the world like a thief in the night yeah. by surprise. So we cannot – this cannot be the same time the rapture happens because even Satan has readied his army, and they're pointing weapons ready to, to meet Jesus at his coming, right? Uh, yeah, and the word rapture, if it goes back, and it's like – when you snatch something violently from someone's hand, uh, and, and they, they don't see it coming, you know, because that's, that's the whole point of it. You don't want them to know you're about to take something that they have, um, and, and that's the rapture. No one is going to know. By the time you realize what's happened, it's already happened. It's in too the late. twinkling of an eye. Um, that's right. You, you, you know, we, we were talking about, you know, uh, eventual God and, and, you know, 18 tells about the birds eating the flesh and uh, the captain. Now, in, in our view, when we're looking at it like we were talking about the blood and, and all of it, okay, uh, we, we don't like that. I mean, this is something really that, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a disturbing image. Uh, but we, if we look at it from the point of view of God and, and, and the glorified body, when, when we see this, we are going to understand that this is, the right decision. This is the the right judgment that is made by God. We don't see it now because you know in our human minds we don't see it, but we're going to understand it um, once we uh, we are in a glorified body and we come with Him uh, for this judgment. Amen, brother. And you know, again, the Antichrist and the kings of the earth, their armies are gathered to make war against Jesus as He's coming back with all the saints. So uh, if you imagine this this picture, you know, we're all coming down from heaven glorified. OK, and we're all hovering in the air and Satan has readied his army because he knows how to read the Bible. He knows he has seven years. Matter of fact, at the midpoint, he knew he, his time was short. 
<laughs> yes. yes. So he knows how to count. Okay. So again, this is not the rapture. This is the second coming. And he's going to have the audacity <laughs> to mm -hmm. try and use earthly weapons, most likely nuclear weapons, the most powerful things we have down here, mm -hmm. to fire at the son of the living God. Mm -hmm. And all Jesus is going to do is speak a word and it is over. <laughs> <laughs> This is not even a battle, man. It's like, you know, what are you thinking? Trying to fight against the creator, right? Correct. And and, and when the, on, on 15, uh, it says that, uh, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. We're talking about the word of God because people will be judged according to what is written. That sharp sword, the Bible, and that, that's what they're going to be judged by. And it's talking about a 200, you know, we, we talk about the 200 million army. And to us, 200 million is a lot. Now, imagine how many saints are coming with Jesus, okay? Now, 200 million, I, I believe it's a small number. We're, well, we're well hold on. About, no, not, not just the saints, brother. You're forgetting, you know, the, the holy angels as well. Yes. I mean, you, 200 yes. million to God's army is nothing. And not to mention, yes. God yes. doesn't even need an army. Matter of fact, no. if you look at this uh, chapter, he destroys them by himself. Yes. It's, yes. We're just spectators. Yeah. We're sitting back and we're watching the show, you know, and I'm I'm hoping we have some kind of popcorn and some kind of snacks because I <laughs> want to see the Antichrist and the false prophet get what what's coming to them. And I want to see and we will see uh, uh, Satan get snatched up and cast into the bottomless pit, not the lake of fire until a thousand years later, but the yeah. bottomless pit where he's sealed shut. Right, brother? Uh, correct. And, and we're going to be uh, watching this. Uh, you know, Jesus is going to do. Um, all the judging, and we're going to be watching this. And it says in this chapter, you know, to be joyful. We are going to, and it's hard to say as a human being, you know, you, you, you're the sufferings of others, uh, and you're going to be joyful. But again, we have to see this from a glorified body, from judge, God's judgment, and we're going to see that it's, it's a righteous thing. It's the right thing to do, that these people who are going to go through all this suffering is because they decided this is what they wanted. It's their choice. Amen, brother. And one more verse we'll go over real quick at verse 20. It says, the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him and with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Now, you know, the beast, which is the Antichrist, the false prophet, uh, which is the, the other beast that came out of the earth, his uh, right-hand man, they tried to make war, as we read in the previous verse, 19. They had their mm -hmm. armies point their weapons, but it says in the next verse, <laughs> the beast was taken. Like, there was no effort. Like, Jesus just yeah. took him and took the false prophet, just like that, cast them alive. They don't yes. even go into uh, the temporary Hades where the rest of the wicked are. They're the first occupants of the lake of fire, yes. brother. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, so, and, and the word says that, you know, uh, hell was reserved for Satan and, and, and you know, the, 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 and his angels, uh, because that, that's just going to go there first, like you said. And this, this will cast, um, the prophet and the, uh, and the beast will cast there, um, and they, they, they are being joined now by Satan himself. Yeah, because, well, here's the thing. Satan will be joined at the end of the millennium. Satan will be locked yeah. up in the abyss for a thousand years yeah. uh, during the millennium. Now, the what's interesting about the Antichrist and false prophet being cast alive in the lake of fire, they don't even stand before the great white throne judgment. There's no need for them to stand right. before the great white throne judgment. God is going to judge them harsher than any other human to ever exist, even more than Hitler and even maybe, maybe, probably on the same level as Judas, right? Uh, co co correct. Uh, uh, and, and, and this is just a thought that comes from in God's mind. I mean, when, when he takes, he doesn't even have to say a word, uh, and this happens. Um, and, and you're talking about the beast, the prophet, they thought they were powerful, uh, they were serving Satan, and they thought that, you know, they were they were it until um, God showed them that, uh, you, you know, it's like, uh, you can't even compare a human being to a, a newborn baby, you know, the difference in, in, in power and authority, it's much more than that. Um, but they will know, and, and it, it'll be done quickly. It, it won't brother. take a long time. 
Amen. And wow, time has flown. So yeah. as always, we want to go ahead and uh, end this segment uh, with the gospel presentation. Um, you know, so Brother Lewis, if there are people uh, watching that uh, need to know the gospel, that that maybe they're questioning their eternal destiny, what do you have to say to them, my friend? We have the word of God and it, it, it's talking to each and every human being because God wants them to understand who he is, what he wants from us, but what he also has for those who not accept uh, his plan of salvation. And, and he's warning people. This is a warning uh, of what's going to happen, but it's, it's a warning for those who do not accept his plan of salvation. And you have to know, and every human being at one point or another does this because we did this and we turn to Jesus. You, you wonder, you wonder about eternity. You wonder, is, is there a God? You wonder if everything that's written in the word is true. So you seek him out. And if you seek him out with all your heart, he will answer and you will know. Um, because you do need a uh, someone to save you from your own sins because you can't do it on your own. You cannot pay that debt to an all-powerful, holy, and eternal God. Amen. So if you guys are, all you have to do is call out to Christ from your heart, you know, ask him to save you in your own way. Believe the gospel as it is written in the scriptures that Christ uh, uh, died for our sins and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Uh, you know, if you believe that, then all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a promise from God Almighty. And the good news is he wants you to be saved. Yes. He doesn't want any to perish. So, all right, um, before we go, uh, don't forget to subscribe to our channel, hit that like button, share, and hit the notification bell. So that way, anytime we do a video, you guys are notified uh, to the video that we just uploaded. I uh, don't forget to visit our merch store. We got a lot of uh, uh, cool designs there, shirts, all that good stuff to represent the word in your everyday life. Um, okay, until next time, my friends. And don't forget to join us next week for Chapter 20. Chapter 20. We're almost done. I can't believe it, but we're almost done. Uh, next week, Chapter 20. Until next time, my friends, look up. Our redemption draws near. Maranatha. <laughs>